evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Laurent Dubois. I'm the academic director of the Karsh Institute of Democracy, and I'm welcoming you here on behalf of the Miller Center's program on Democracy and Capitalism, the Karsh Institute, and Jefferson's Monticello. Um, I'm just going to be introducing the panelists and then hand it over to Scott for the conversation. Um, Tonight's, com tonight's conversation is focused around Hamilton, Jefferson, and America's founding question, can democracy and capitalism coexist? And I think it's fair to say we have sort of the best possible scholars to have this, this debate tonight. Um, the conversation is going to be moderated by Scott Miller, who is assistant professor and director of the Project on Democracy and Capitalism here at the Miller Center. He received his PhD from UVA, had postdoctoral fellowship at the Yale School of Management, and has written widely about financial crises and economic development. He's got two forthcoming books that I know we're all eager to read, Developing Economy, Emerging Republic, Crisis, Independence, and the Rise of American Economic Power, coming out with Chicago Press, and a co-authored book with the Miller Center's Sidney Milkus called Democracy and Capitalism, Can Democracy and De Capitalism Be Reconciled? We're very lucky to have such a stellar scholar directing Democracy and Capitalism program here. He's organized a series of great conversations and exchanges over the past years, like the one we're about to enjoy. So thank you, Scott, for all your work. Um, we're, again, tremendously lucky to have two scholars uh, to talk about American history and this key question. Frank Cogliano is professor of American history at the University of Edinburgh, where he also serves as the University uh, Dean International for North America. He's currently the interim Saunders Director of the International Center for Jefferson Studies here at Monticello. He's a specialist on the history of the American Revolution and the early United States, and the author of nine books, the author or editor of nine books, including his classic Revolutionary America, 1763 to 1815, now in its third edition, and a vital reference for scholars and teachers on the revolutionary era. He hosts a podcast called The Whiskey Rebellion and is a frequent guest on BBC and other outlets. And hot off the presses from Harvard University Press just this month, is his new book, Revolutionary Friendship, Washington, Jefferson, and the American Republic. Thank you for being with us today, Frank. Joanne Freeman comes to us from Yale University, where she's the class of 1954 professor of history and American studies. Um, she specializes in politics and political culture of the revolutionary and early national periods in American history. She got her PhD from the University of Virginia as well, right here, and is the author of the 2001 Affairs of Honor, National Politics in the New Republic from Yale University Press, which won the Best Book Award from the Society of the Historians of the Early American Republic. Her edited volume, Alexander Hamilton's Writings from the Library of America, was one of the Atlantic Monthly's Best Books of 2001, kind of the essential reference that you have here with you today. <laughs> um, She's also the volume, sorry, excuse me. Her most recent book, The Field of Blood, Violence in Congress and the Road to the Civil War, was a finalist for the Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize, a semi-finalist for Penn Galbraith Award for Nonfiction, and a New York Times Notable Book of 2018. She writes regularly for the New York Times, appears frequently in documentaries and radio shows for the BBC, NPR, and the History Channel. Um, and she also has a webcast every morning, Friday 10 a.m., about democracy and history called History Matters, and so does coffee. So you can tune into that Friday mornings. Um, thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you all especially for sharing your wisdom and knowledge tonight, um, and uh, enjoy, enjoy the conversation. I'll hand it over to you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the Miller Center of Public Affairs. Um, and we have a wonderful, wonderful program for you tonight. I am so excited for this. I've been looking to do this since I started with the project here in 2021. And, and I'm, in fact, so excited uh, that if you took uh, the, the Scott C. Miller GBT that I am creating of myself and gave it the instruction that said, like, you have an hour and a half to create the thing that Scott Miller would most want to do in the world, it would describe almost exactly what we are doing <laughs> right here, right now. And you're kind of chuckling, but there are friends watching this with their head in their hands saying, <laughs> He's not joking, people, but I will have that as a badge of honor uh, and wear it proudly. So thank you very much. So, so what is this badge that, that I'm wearing? So tonight we're going to talk for the next hour and 15 minutes or so about two of the central figures in American history, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, and how they believe democracy and capitalism could or could not possibly exist in America. So the question is, why should we 
do this, right? It's, it's obvious why I should do this. I'm very weird about these kinds of things, but why should you spend your beautiful Monday night here in Charlottesville in this room thinking about this? Or put another way, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for hundreds of people to discuss ethereal concepts and men who have been dead for hundreds of years, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to that gathering. Early American history joke, boom, awesome. <laughs> All right. So the question is, what is this gathering? Why should we be here? Just a couple of points to frame the conversation. So the first is that Hamilton and Jefferson's actions in ways both practical and theoretical remain central elements of how Americans conceptualize themselves even today, right? In practical terms, we interact with their legacies all the time. With Hamilton, the United States government still has not, please God, defaulted on its debt. And in the case of, of Thomas Jefferson, we are having this conversation here in the university, right, that he founded. But in a larger sense, the ideas these two men presented remain core to several very important American identities. We could list the, these all night, right? Urban versus rural, industry versus agriculture, national versus state, finance versus trade, immigrant versus native born, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So that brings me to my second point, that Hamilton and Jefferson and the founders more broadly are still deployed every day commonly in the, the salvos of modern uh, partisan politics in the United States, right? Almost every day, whenever I go talk to anybody, I get asked, you know, what would the founders think about X? I'm sure our scholars here get that too. The first thing I tend to say is, well, the founders really didn't agree on much of anything, so that's a difficult question to answer. But second, I find the framing especially interesting because what is essentially being said is if the founders thought something, there's a weight to it, right? There's a gravitas. There's an importance there, right? And as a fan of these guys, I love the sentiment, but I also believe it can be very, very dangerous. And that brings me to my third point here, is the danger comes from the fact that I believe we dramatically and very often misunderstand these people. And that can be very, very problematic. The novelist L.P. Hartley opened his 1953 novel, The Go-Between, with the phrase, the past is a different country, they do things differently there. Right? The past is a different country. They do things differently there. And I feel like nothing could be more true when we look at the founders, Hamilton and Jefferson in particular, and how they viewed the subject that we now call democracy and capitalism, right? These two linchpins of modern liberal society are hotly contested. They're all over the news. We argue about them all the time, and we try to enlist the founders in our arguments. Right? The problem is that they largely wouldn't understand these arguments as they, as, as they wouldn't understand the arguments as we frame them, right? So what we can do is try to understand these as they did and then move forward with those debates. And that brings me to my final, final point of framing. I do think, to borrow the words of another president that I love, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should be here tonight, right? <laughs> Quite the contrary to modern perceptions, Americans have never agreed on the relationship of democracy and capitalism and what it should be in America. I want to emphasize that. We have never agreed on this function. I have my own views on this subject. I've made them very clear, both in this room and all around this university. But the fact of the matter is to pretend that we have always had a consensus on these issues and only now are we starting to diverge from this consensus is not just a historical, but it can be in fact dangerous. Right? So in that spirit, I hope tonight we can go into that different country of the past and understand how these two legends of American history viewed their future and indeed our present. So one final note before we get to the conversation. Uh, for the next about half hour or so, we're gonna have, I'm gonna moderate a conversation with our scholars, uh, Joanne and Frank. And then we wanna open it up to the room, both uh, the, the in-person room here, but also the viewers online. So you have note cards there on your chair. So when you hopefully will have lots of questions, please write those down, hold them up and, and we'll get those up to us. And for those of you watching online, uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Go and put your questions in here or in there and, and we'll be sure to get those up to, to me as well. And we'll get there in about half an hour, 35 minutes. But enough of me yapping. <laughs> 
All right, let's, let's start this off. So, easy one to get us going, Frank and Joanne. So how would you translate tonight's question, can democracy and capitalism coexist in America? How would you translate that question to Hamilton and Jefferson if indeed the past is a different country and they do things differently there? How could we present this conversation in terms that they would understand? Jefferson's very polite, so he's gonna let Hamilton go first. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, I'll start with the foreign countryness of this. Um, and that is um, democracy, the word democracy and capitalism, the word capitalism, did not mean what they mean now then. So, for one thing, if we were to say, can these two things coexist, we would really have to explain that in some degree of detail. Democracy when they thought about democracy, they looked back to ancient Greece, ancient Rome, they thought about actual everyone participating in government. They weren't thinking of representative government, they were thinking of Athens, they were thinking of a, a broad sweeping involvement, and as they did throughout this period, kind of enlightenment thinking, they used all of the past as a big grab bag of pattern seeking. They would look across all of history and say, well, what are the patterns of whatever? And democracy, for many of them, and certainly I'm, we're going to get to Hamilton, I'm sure, um, was problematic. So if we were to ask them about democracy, and it is true they don't agree on anything. When I lecture about this, I say there is no founder blob. So you cannot <laughs> say the founders thought. Um, but even on the question of democracy, many of them, and some of whom you might not assume would be the case, had problems with it. But what they did understand was that the government that they were creating was different from the governments that were in most of the rest of the world. And one of the main ways in which it was different, the world is monarchies, America's democratic constitutional republic is grounded on public opinion and the public will more than monarchy would have been perceived as being grounded on them. And that fact that the public really mattered, that their will mattered, they didn't absolutely know who this meant, what, who is the public, how do we figure out what they think? It's one of the things I've always found fascinating about the period is watching them say to each other, you know, public opinion, <laughs> public opinion matters. Who is the public? I don't know. <laughs> how do we get their opinion? Not sure. Um, but, but that component would be the democracy component, right? That, that the people matter, what they think matters. We don't absolutely know who they are. We're not absolutely sure we like the way that they think. But this is a thing that supposedly makes this new world government better or different. Hamilton might say different. Maybe Jefferson would say better. He'd say better. Yeah. Um, but, but so, so the, uh, that's one word, democracy, that we would have to totally redefy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna now turn to you with capitalism. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if, if I could add a little bit about democracy, but yes. thank, thanks, Joanne. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think... Where democracy is concerned, Joanne's quite right. In the late 18th century, it's a complicated term. Our people, the people we're talking about tonight, were much more com comfortable with Republican or a republic small than a, R. a small R republic than a democracy. We tend to use these words interchangeably. They did not. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to, to bear in mind. And for them, a republic was a polity where sovereignty was derived from the people. How the people exercised that sovereignty or, and, and how the government reflected that or the degree to which they listened to the people once that sovereignty had been exercised um, is something they debated. Hamilton thought the people should step back. Jefferson had a little more faith in the people, I think, but it was, it was a matter of degree. But democracy itself, and this is, this is the age, the turn of the 18th, from the 18th to the 19th century, when democracy is starting to become an acceptable word, but it, it, it but it's scary too it's because scary. of France, right? That's the French right. Revolution it absolutely yeah. makes democracy scary. You're right. Yeah. The other thing to bear in mind, and and um, I want to credit one of my colleagues at Monticello, Susan Stein, for this observation, which has stayed with me since since I heard her say it a few weeks ago. In 1776, when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, the kind of creedal statement, the foundational doc document of this country and our democracy, there were 160 people who lived on the mountaintop at Monticello. 
one of them could vote. So whether it's a republic or a democracy, it's not what we understand by the term. And I think that's important, important to consider. In answer to Scott's question, how we would explain this, it would be very difficult. And this is the easier of the two terms. <laughs> yeah. So when we get I to know. capitalism, <laughs> yeah. Joanne and I spent a lovely hour in my office this afternoon with her thumbing through Hamilton and me looking through Jefferson. We were like a couple of ministers referring to text. <laughs> <laughs> what, what word did they use? Because they didn't really use capitalism. Right. What's the word? And the fact that we were doing that and we couldn't come, and up, couldn't with one. come up with a word is pretty wonderful. Yeah, we, it was a, Joanne and I have known each other for 20 years. It was a wonderful moment and we really <laughs> enjoyed it. But we couldn't, we couldn't come up with the word they would use or that we would use to explain capitalism to them. Mm. And so this is a very, I don't know how many questions you think you're going to get through, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but this is a very long-winded way of not answering your question. Well, and we even <laughs> said, and this will lead, I'm sure, to other things. We even said, there isn't an ism. Yeah. Right? There's no, there wasn't an ism. It was a, a period of invention and experimentation. Uh, and there were many things that they were thinking about and acting on and devising that are blended in with questions that involve what we now label capitalism. But what we now assume to be something that we can define and there's a system and it's, you know, we feel that we know what capitalism is. They didn't have that in the way that we have it. So the fact that we spent a good, I don't know, 40 minutes, like thumbing through their letters and then deciding no ism, tells you, again, gets back to the, the sort of foreign country idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, then I, I, I completely agree. So then the question is, if we could go back into Hamilton and Jefferson's world, specifically thinking about these concepts that we now know, right, as democracy and capitalism, what events, modes of thought, kind of structures in their society kind of shaped how they thought about, let's just say for the moment, the intersection of politics and economics, broadly put. How, how, what influenced how they think about those issues? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start small. That's a big question. Um, you can certainly see, when you think about Hamilton uh, during the revolution, as a revolutionary, and he's young, he's you know, 19 years old, 20 years old, and he's a revolutionary, and he's fervent in the cause, and he's Washington's aide, and he's writing pamphlets. At that period, he says something along the line, it's going to be a bad paraphrase, I more or less distrust anything that is out of order. Like he's a revolutionary, right? He's fighting a revolution. So he's saying, on the one hand, these political ideas matter. On the other hand, he's thinking about property and he's thinking about order, social order. Even at that point, he's already interested in finance, financial order. And so in his mind, certainly they're tied, but they're, they're tied in, we, we were talking about political economy before as a way to get at this, that they assumed, and certainly Hamilton did, that whatever was going on in this sort of new experimental government that they were creating, and for Hamilton, he very much looked towards England particularly and said, well, that's pretty good. We can do something sort of like that. But even so, the experimental political um, mode that they were operating in and the fact that the economy could sort of echo that but would have to be different because the politics was different, that's part of the it's one of my favorite things about the period, right? The contingency of that moment, that they didn't know what would happen, that they were inventing things as they went. And so they understood absolutely that politics and economy came together, shaped society, um, but they shaped culture. But they were very much in the process of figuring things out and sometimes improvising. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that, um for Jefferson, to, to answer the two parts of your question, Scott, I guess, uh, the event that's most important is the revolution itself. Hmm. You know, that's the event that shapes much of his thinking. And of course, he's a participant in that, but that, that is such a profound event and such a profoundly significant event. As far as you mentioned systems, well, the revolution is about emerging from the British Empire and an imperial mm -hmm. framework, a transatlantic imperial framework. I think that's the system that's shaping the world he inhabits and thinks about. And, I, and that goes for Hamilton too, of course. Um, and, and 
everybody who experiences the, the American Revolution. Uh, but I think it's the combination of that system and the breakdown of that system, at mm -hmm. least in North America, through the events of the revolution that lead him to try to kind of reconceptualize what the world will look like. But I think Joanne's right. They wouldn't have used democracy and capitalism as phrases, but they do use political economy yeah. as a system of the intersection of politics and, and economics. Well, the fact that we both landed on the revolution, hmm. right, which it is not surprising, right, that, that for, for that generation, that was the shaping event. For Jefferson, I think, to a greater degree than for Hamilton, but still, that's a, that's a becoming moment. Right. Um, and, and because of that, how could that not last and shape the becoming process that they were engaged in on an ongoing basis as just part of that founding generation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's take a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and level set for a second. And I, I'm gonna come to the Hamilton expert and the Jefferson expert. If you could give us a sense it can be quite broad if need be, but what would be like Jefferson's ideal economy or political economy, if we will? And what would Hamilton's ideal economy or political economy be? Just to try to get a sense of, okay, when these guys are kind of thinking about what they want, whether it clashes with the other or not, in most case clashed, what was that? What are we talking about here? He said Jefferson first. Okay. <laughs> so to some extent, what you learned in school is true. Jefferson does want the United States to be an agricultural republic. He does say in the notes on the state of Virginia that, you know, I don't know if God has a chosen people, but if he does, they are those who till the earth. And he means that. Um, he doesn't, however, believe the United States should be, consist of subsistence farmers. So the reason he favors agriculture is not just that he has an agricultural background himself, but also because he believes that the only way the United States can survive as a republic is if its citizens are virtuous. And that farmers, yeoman farmers, that is male heads of household who own their own land, are the only people who are incorruptible because they can't be influenced by their employers. And therefore, the he looked at history, and Joanne is absolutely right. They, they studied the ancient past. Um, he looked at Greek and Roman history. He said, all republics fail. Why do they fail? Because their citizens lose their virtue and they become corrupt. The best way to prevail or to maintain virtue and to resist corruption is to be independent. And you achieve independence by owning your own land and tilling that land. He does not, though, want Americans to be subsistent farmers. He recognizes there's a need for some manufacturing in the United States and that the American farmers need to be able to sell their produce abroad and also buy manufactured goods. We know he was a shopper. He brought 86 <laughs> crates of stuff home from France in 1789. He's not against having stuff, uh, but he says, as long as, for as long as possible, let Europeans manufacture our stuff because we don't want the corrupting influence of manufacturing. So some manufacturing in order to sustain agricultural production and we should export what we raise in order to support ourselves. But there's a sweet spot there where we can flourish economically whilst maintaining our Republican system. And so that's Jefferson's vision of political economy. It requires two things that are really important though, land, and that's why the Louisiana Purchase will be important, but also access to trade. And as a corollary to that, of course, the acquisition of land comes at the expense of indigenous people. And not everybody's an independent farmer. A lot of agricultural labor is provided by enslaved labor. So it's a more complicated picture than, I've, than the simple version I've given you, but those are, yeah. that's a short answer. Hamilton, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I suppose I hadn't thought of it quite this way, but you're talking about virtue and politics and the economy. Hamilton was really not interested in virtue in the economy. As a matter of fact, I know. <laughs> hey, are we already at that point, right? <laughs> but but he he sincerely, I mean, he's the guy um, at the Constitutional Convention and, and who argues, and this is pretty consistent throughout his life. People aren't angels. People aren't basically good. They're selfish. They're self-interested. So what you have to do is create something powerful enough that can channel 
passions. That's the way to have a nation that can be growing, it can channel the ways in which people's passions operate, so it does, it's not a matter of virtue or not virtue. And he, I think even in The Federalist, he's like, really, are we gonna be like Sparta? <laughs> we're gonna be like surrendering things? <laughs> no, you know, we are not. Virtue isn't a part of that equation for him. But the channeling of power is, and that's power is part of how he thinks of the economy. He is, as I mentioned earlier, looking at Europe and particularly looking at England and saying, look at them, they're independent, they're strong, they stand tall on the world stage. We can work towards that. We can be like that. We can create manufacturing in some way. We can move in that direction. But he also acknowledges, and he says this um, in a way as only an outsider could, uh, it, it, there in the, his report on manufacturers, which he does as Secretary of the Treasury, he says that you know, there's kind of a mechanical genius in these, these people here in this country that we can really take advantage of. And the word that he used, rather than virtue, the word that he uses is energy. Mm -hmm. He says, you know what, we can, we can create a system and it can channel people's energies. And industry is part of that because people can have jobs in industry and we can rouse their ambition and they will be working and this will be great. And the energies that they're creating will be funneled into the government, funneled into the nation. If there's one word you could attach to Hamilton's views of the economy and of politics and of government, mm -hmm. that would be the word, would be energy. So that's what he's thinking about when it comes to the economy. In a, in a variety of different ways. So is it fair to say, Joanne, uh -oh. that <laughs> Hamilton has a more modern outlook in the sense that he's not relying on virtue and the virtue of the citizenry, which we might, in our more cynical age, think is cute but not really feasible, um, or sort of well, sweet, but whereas he's saying, no, 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 look, human beings are this way. I mean, it's very Smithian. Uh, well, it is, but, so it's really of that moment too, though, right? Right, of course, yeah. So, so I, I mean, on the one hand, you could say it sounds modern, right? Yeah, harumph, you know. <laughs> yes, we shall all be virtuous and everything, you know, in that sense, it does sound more modern, but he's, he's looking at the old world as his model. So it sounds yeah. modern, but in a way, he's less interested in some of the innovation that Jefferson, I think, is more interested in. So maybe more modern isn't the way to think about it, but it's about modernity. And Britain epitomizes the modern from Hamilton's from standpoint, Hamilton, yes. whereas Jefferson looks at Britain and France, and he'd been to Europe, Hamilton hadn't, and yes. says, look, it's corrupt, it's terrible, people live in squalor, we don't want that. So right. it, it's, a, it's a differing approaches to the modern, maybe, is the better way to put it. They're modern. Yeah. They're modern, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I just want to remind everybody, as we get going, uh, if you do have questions both online, please put those in the, the Q&A box. And for those of you here in the room, if you have questions, please write those on your cards, and, and we'll collect those. Um, I want to I wanna just ask a, a quick little follow-up, because this statement um, on virtue and energy I think is super important manifesting kind of into the present. So I, I, I did my homework. I, I went back and there's a quote from Jefferson and, and I would ask Frank, maybe you could follow up on this question of what does this corruption that, that Jefferson envisioned mean? Like, what does that mean? He sees you sh we shouldn't have them work in factories. There's this corruption. Everybody will be corrupt. They'll lose their virtue. But we don't know exactly what that means. And there's, there's a quote um, from uh, a letter that he wrote in 1814 where he said, referring to people who worked in factories, Jefferson wrote to, to a friend, he said, does not the moral, moral coercion of want, needing a wage, subject the, worker, the worker's will as despotically to that of their employer as the physical constraint does the soldier, the seaman, or the slave? So Jefferson is saying the person in the factory subject to the will of their employer and not having recourse to their land is as restrained in his mind as the soldier, the seaman, or the slave, which is something he obviously knew quite well. So what is this thing that Jefferson is so scared of when it comes to going into these factories and for the economists in the room becoming much more productive, if you will? Why does that kind of scare him so much. It's about dependence. 
Ah. If you work in a factory, or if you're enslaved, or you're a seaman, mm -hmm. you don't control how and when you work and what your working conditions are. Somebody else does. Mm. And so one of the paradoxes, we may think about it as hypocrisy of the age, is when we hear the American revolutionaries in the run-up to the revolution complain about British, uh, British plot to enslave them. And we say, how can you possibly say that? What they mean by enslavement is that somebody else is telling them what to do. And they, so it, it, it's about dependence as opposed to independence. And so I think that's the main concern. And I think that is his fear about manufacturing. Mm. So the people who work in factories and live in cities are dependent on others. Mm -hmm. The corruption will be that the people who pay their wages might tell them how to vote. Mm. An independent yeoman farmer who lives on his own land can decide for his own, on his own who to vote for and is incorruptible. Yeah. Jo Joanne, then, then the question is for Hamilton. I mean, Hamilton was no slouch when it came to wanting independence, right? So why did Hamilton not have a problem with this concept? What was the difference here um, that made Jefferson so, I, I could even say, intrinsically fearful of this dependence and Hamilton not necessarily so? Jefferson is thinking about individual people hmm. and their dependence. Hamilton isn't. Mm. Hamilton's thinking of an independent nation that can stand on its own. Hmm. You know, he's not thinking the people in the factories are the people in the factories. I mean, he even we were, when we were thumbing through papers earlier, Hamilton in his report on manufacturers even says, you know what? Women and children will have more to do too. <laughs> Bonk, you know, yeah. throw them into the mix. He's not thinking yeah. about the individual. He's thinking, big picture, and again, looking to, and seeing what another part of the world has and the, the strength and independence that that gives them, knowing very well that the United States does not have any strength or independence in that way, politically, economically. And that's what he wants to build towards, and that's what he's using you know, his ideas about the economy to build towards. Mm -hmm. And corruption makes me think of the really famous story about uh, at Jefferson's a dinner table. John Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton are at the dinner table. Do you know that? Right, and he took, says the British Constitution is we'd be the best in the world if you took the corruption without out. the corruption. And, and what Hamilton does your boy says, say? With the corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what he means by that is um, there's all the sort of you know behind the scenes stuff and people giving things to each other and taking things from each other and whatever that makes it go. Like that's just practical. That's how government works. What I love about this story is that Jefferson writes it down, right, saves it. And he tells this more than once in later years. And Jefferson always, when he has a Hamilton story, he makes it, he writes it down as though Hamilton always took a large pregnant pause before saying something <laughs> radical and bad. So in this story, he's like, Hamilton paused. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Exactly. Uh. With the corruption, right? Yeah. And, 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 but that's a wonderful example, again, of Hamilton looking to the old world and mm. saying, well, yeah, we're not going to be more virtuous than that. And corruption is useful in its way. I mean, he's not saying like, <laughs> you know, but, but he is saying people are people. They're going to have interests. This is the way the world works. This is the way the world works. And, and this is, you know, sometimes, um, when European diplomats would come to the United States in these early years, they would murmur that they'd rather talk with Hamilton than Jefferson because Hamilton was like practical and Jefferson had this sort of loftier idea and he didn't seem necessarily practical to some of the Europeans who came to the United States. And that's, this is kind of built into that too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the questions, <clears throat> excuse me, that we tend to think of or one of the concepts that we tend to be as the fundamental determiner of social well-being is economic growth, right? GDP per capita, when you look at kind of social determinants, uh, one of the, the very top up there with certain kind of life expectancy or something like that is, is GDP per capita, how, how relatively well off you are. Um, and this idea of growth has become very central to the systems that we have in the world, right? Can we say anything about how Hamilton and Jefferson maybe not have thought about GDP per capita in the way we think about it now, but what should the purpose of an economy be? I mean, should it be simply to provide 
the base like needs of the people? Should it be to actually really try to grow it in a way that uh, will, will lead to kind of greater acquisitions of economic power? Should it be the provision of, of independence or independency, as they say? What is the purpose of, of economic development to these two different humans? I mean, you know, I don't think Hamilton felt that he had the luxury to think that far ahead. I think mm -hmm. for Hamilton, he was thinking about stability. Yeah. The economy was about stability. Everything was not stable. And, you know, the degree to which when he becomes Secretary of the Treasury, the, the basic, basic way in which there isn't stability, there isn't knowledge about what's out there. You know, one of the first things he does when he becomes Secretary of the Treasury is he sends kind of a questionnaire out to customs collectors. How big is your poor? You tell me something about the business. He's just collecting information. He doesn't have it. There isn't any kind of national organization along those lines. So when he's thinking about his plans and when he's thinking about the economy, he's partly thinking of creating a national something that will be stable, that will be able to deal with revolutionary war debts, that will be able to use that debt in one way or another that will be economically useful for the nation. It, it, more than anything else, I think that, that's where he is in that moment. And he, I think he dies before he gets a chance mm -hmm. to sort of go beyond that. But stability is really what he's worried about. Mm -hmm. Jefferson does think about growth, and he thinks about e economic growth. Given that model I talked about a few minutes ago, his model of political economy, it's premised, as I said, on acquisition of land. Mm -hmm. That's why the Louisiana Purchase is so important. The United States has 5 million people in 1801 when Jefferson becomes president. It will have tens of millions within a couple of decades, and certainly by the end of the, the century. It's grow, its population is growing at such a rapid rate that he believes that geographic growth is central to maintaining his vision of political economy. He confidently predicts that the Louisiana Purchase will satiate the land needs of the United States for a thousand years, um, last till about 1848. <laughs> uh, but but his, his vision is, is actually quite coherent and, and growth is central to it, but he's conceiving of growth. His vision of geographic expansion is premised on assumptions about political politics and economics and economic growth, I think. Mm. But here's what's interesting about that is there were a lot of Federalists sort of Hamiltonian sort, who were very nervous about that kind of growth because the government couldn't extend its power out there. So you were going to get disorder. You were going to break the government in some way. You were going to expose all of its weaknesses. So at, at the same time that it might be tempting to think, you know, yes, empire, power, growth, Hamilton and the Federalists, they were very worried about the reach and survival of the national government itself. And the Civil War, which originated in part over the, the debate over what to do with newly right. acquired land, right. which seems to vindicate that view. It's true. Or that concern. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I want to take a little bit of, of a shift and talk about class and, and not in a kind of a traditional Marxian sense or anything like that. But one of the things that I've kind of said as a shorthand to my students, and I would like you as the ultimate experts to <laughs> critique this and, and tell me if, I, if I'm brilliant or if I'm wrong, um, but that Jefferson wanted, all things considered, a, a more equal society and Hamilton wanted a more mobile society. Do you think that that's a fair statement or, or how did they think about class in terms of just like the very real day to day, not even in a theoretical level, but just in terms of how you organized a society? How do they think about that? Well, one of the things that I always enjoy um, thinking about when you talk about class in this period is that they didn't have a sense of, once again, foreign country, mm -hmm. a sense of class in the way that we do, you yep. know, mm -hmm. upper class, middle class. And the way that they talk about people in different levels of society is wonderfully vague. You know, men of the first sort, men of the second sort, mm -hmm. men of the lower sort, men of the, you know, they kept coming up with ways to rank people. And they certainly had a sense of different kinds of people having different status and, and being higher or lower than others in society. It's part of what drove me to be interested in dueling. Because when you fight a duel with someone, you have to be equals. 
-hmm. And what I was interested in was people who decided that they couldn't fight because that wasn't there. So they understood in a way that we might not some social distinctions that were clear to them that we might not see. So on the one hand, class in, its, in and of itself is problematic. But you know, I think Hamilton um, assumed that mobility would be part of what people are gearing towards, right? I mean, if he wants people to be working and f sort of feeding energy into the system, then mobility is going to be OK. On the other hand, he also very much assumed the better sort are the ones who should be in power, mm -hmm. right? And so I think in his sort of ideal world, the better sort would be in power, but the lower sort would be sort of being ambitious, and working, and you know, fueling the energy into the economy and into the nation. So kind of a kind of a mix. One of the most astute portraits of Jefferson, I think, uh, was written by Richard Hofstadter many many years ago in his 1948 book, The American Political Tradition and the Men Who Made It. And the title of his essay, the chapter on Jefferson, is The Aristocrat is Democrat. Mm. It's a really good, it's a very astute title and a very uh, interesting and powerful portrait of Jefferson. And I think Hofstadter is getting at something there. So Jefferson didn't use the word class, of course, because the language of class is also the language of capitalism. We've already <laughs> talked about that challenge. Um, but he idealized um, the common white man, mm -hmm. and race is really important in this context, and the common free white man. So in his draft 1776 Constitution for Virginia, he doesn't call for the prohibition of the property requirements for voting. But he does call for taking land from the public domain and giving it to every free white man so that they can meet the property requirements for voting, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is an early articulation of this kind of vision I was talking about a minute ago. So I think Jefferson idealizes free white men and sees a measure of equality between and among them that's quite egalitarian and radical for its time. Sure. I, you know, and the abolition of primogeniture and entail is part of this. You know, so I think he does actually act in this area as well, but act on this. How does he then negotiate between his kind, the elite kind, and these other people that he's... Well, and that's where Hofstadter's brilliant, because actually <laughs> he's a person, he's, he's a great uh, kind of proponent of small d democracy He's really uncomfortable around common people. <laughs> he's just not good at it, you yeah. know. And, and, and you know, he's much more comfortable around his own kind, uh, whilst idealizing uh, people who who are inferior to him in the in the social order of, of early national Virginia. And you're absolutely right, Joanne. I mean, they, 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 he's just not comfortable around them. He he, he lacks a We're common about touch. Ideology and reality. Yeah, he lacks a common touch. There's no doubt about that. Um, Yet, kind of philosophically and ideologically, he, he has a greater commitment to common people, however we're going to define them, than, than Hamilton, oh, for, for example. Sure. Um, uh, who, and there's a kind of real paradox here, because Jefferson's background is much more privileged than Hamilton's was. But right. there we go. Yeah. Right, right. No, and there's a great, actually, you referenced a little earlier this story. There's another part of it I want to talk about. Yeah. A great example of Hamilton negotiating with the masses and, and bluntly showing what he does and doesn't believe, right? So he, he really is committed to the idea. He says it over and over again, like, OK, I know what's going on here. It's not what happens over in England, not what happens over in Europe. And I know it's different. And I'm going to do what I can do to push us as close as I can to England. But I'm going to live for the, this kind of government. I'm going to live up to the smaller Republican government. So there's a big um, protest against the Jay Treaty. Uh, in 1795 in Lower Manhattan and um, on the steps of Federal Hall. Uh, he, he sees that this protest is supposed to start at noon. He climbs up to the steps and he basically says, I shall take over this protest. So first, he tries to hold forth to explain the Jay Treaty, right? And no one wants to hear and they're booing and hissing. And then he says, OK, OK, OK. If you want to hear me, step over here. And if you don't want to hear me, step over there. And of course, no one does anything. <laughs> and I think what one newspaper describes that moment as full of hissings, coughings, and hootings, <laughs> which is quite wonderful. Um, 
he then tries. He actually says, you know what? Trinity Church is right down the street. Why don't we go to Trinity Church? And I will go line by line through the J Treaty. And if I explain it to you, you will like it. And the crowd basically says, yeah, we read it. It's been published. We know it. We don't need you to explain this to us. So now he's kind of stuck. And the crowd is getting angry. This is what you referred to earlier. Um, and someone in the crowd just throws a rock at his head, right? Like, you pompous, like, bonk. And he storms off. You know, he actually says, men of order, follow me. And like three Federalists limp off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then on the street, he gets involved in two duels um, in which he's, he's mortified at what happened. And so he ends up getting involved in these affairs of honor. But later, once again, he's trying to confront the fact that the public needs to understand and they need to agree on what they think matters. He actually proposes going door to door. Mm -hmm. You know, like, ding dong, let me explain the J Treaty. Like, he somehow <laughs> thinks he's going to be able, like, individually to talk to people and explain this to them. So on the one hand, he really is trying yeah. to engage with the populace, but it's all sort of hero Hamilton who will rise, you know, come down from above and explain to the populace, and then they will know that he is right and that this is a good thing. And, so, and we all know how well New Yorkers would deal with somebody <laughs> ringing their doorbell and telling them a bunch of stuff. That would work really well. Sorry, Frank. No, I was just going to say, Joanne, so are you, are you saying that Alexander Hamilton is the founding mansplainer of the United <laughs> States? <laughs> Ooh. Uh, no, actually, because mansplaining largely is about women, and okay. he wouldn't have even bothered engaging well, okay. with people. <laughs> <laughs> last, uh, last question for me before we get to the, the questions from the audience. So uh, if you do want to ask a question, both in the room and online, please uh, uh, send those up. We've got a bunch of them. Um, but I don't think we could get through a, a conversation on democracy and capitalism and Hamilton and Jefferson if we didn't talk about the presence of the state. right? There is a, a quite caricaturish view that Jefferson is, is you know, a, a hands-off government guy, libertarian, and Hamilton wants the government in and in, involved in any, everything. But, you know, as with virtually everything else in history, there's definite nuance here. Could you speak about how Hamilton and Jefferson kind of conceptualized the role of the state in political economy, I guess we could frame it as such, or just in you know, the, the politics and the economy more broadly? Well, you know, we, we kind of touched on this a little earlier. You know, we, again, thinking from a modern point of view, and you look at someone like Hamilton, and you see that he's like big business guy, and he wants businesses to do well, and he wants the wealthy and the well-born to really succeed, and by Today's standards, you would think, well, that person is probably a Republican, which means they're going to be small state. Mm -hmm. And Hamilton does indeed want the wealthy and well-born to invest their money and status into the new government, but he wants the state to help with that process. We don't put those two things together in, in modern times, mm -hmm. really. So for him, the state is a vital actor. Um, in almost anything, right? That's his, his, his big, or one of his big concerns throughout the 1790s is, and it's valid, right? If you think about the fact that the Constitution is just a couple of years old, right? And, and it's, you know, they, they've been through many forms of government already by the time they get to it. Why would anyone care or listen to what the Constitution is, right? I mean, his constant concern is why, what's going to be the authority of this? What's going to be the value of this? In what way will people want to listen to this? So he's thinking about the state. He's thinking about the state helping as best it can, you know, the economy and also if the wealthy and well-born can contribute and somehow the state can help them help the general good, that's great. But on the other hand, you know, he's also worried about um, he's worried about the balance, I guess I would say, between power and energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and the state is vital to him, um, and he likes order. But he can recognize, as, as much as he recognizes that democracy, he, he's afraid of democracy because it's unpredictable. Who knows what the masses are going to do? He wants the state to be predictable. He wants the state to have authority. He wants it to give the Constitution that kind of weight. But he's kind of an extreme mm -hmm. in the way in which he really wants to strengthen and centralize that 
government. So, and he knows that, yeah. right? That he, he may be a revolutionary, but he's a revolutionary who really believed in the power of the state to, to regulate. I think uh, you, the caricature you laid out, Scott, is generally accurate when it comes to Jefferson. He is skeptical about the state intervention in the economy. However, there are important exceptions. So, you know, he, of course, is the, uh, you know, one of the signal achievements of his presidency is the Louisiana Purchase. That is the, st I've tried to lay out in terms of his political economy, that's the state acting to provide land for citizens of the United States. So and I you think know what Hamilton says about that. Tell us. Dumb luck. <laughs> <laughs> Sore loser. <laughs> um, but the Embargo Act, of course, is the ultimate inter state intervention in yeah. the economy, and you know, which is one of the failures of Jefferson's presidency. But that's a, that's an attempt to of the st to use the power of the state to intervene in the economy to achieve diplomatic ends, mm -hmm. to be sure. But but the, so he's not completely averse to state intervention in the economy, uh, to to be sure. Um, just I, just for the sake of clarification, could you just explain to? Because I agree with you. I mean, the embargo is is one of the most profound executions of state power, I would argue, in American history. Could you explain, just give us a brief summary of what this thing is? Right, so in 1807, there was a danger of war between Britain and the United States. Uh, the, the kind of uh, underlying causes of, of the deteriorating relationship between Britain and the United States that would ultimately result in the War of 1812 were already in place. And as an alternative to going to war, uh, Jefferson proposes uh, an embargo, which is that the United States will not trade with either Britain or France at this point. Well, it basically cuts off all of its international trade in order to seek redress, uh, basically better treatment uh, by, by its adversaries. Uh, it's an economic disaster for the United States. There's no question about it. But and it's New a, England particularly. In New, England, right? New England, yeah. It's, it's grounded in commerce. They're, they're up in arms. That's right, because it's devastating for them. So it, but but it's, it's certainly state intervention in the economy. The one thing I'd say by way of perhaps concluding this is if we go forward to the 1930s and we're talking about um, mm -hmm. capitalism and democracy yeah. and so on and, and state intervention, two things. I'd say one thing in response to Joanne, and I know she knows this. In the 1930s, socialists in the, in the United States celebrated Alexander Hamilton because he favored state intervention in the economy. And they, they're on solid ground in so doing. That surprises a lot of people today. Or be, well, it's surprising to many people today, I think. Franklin Roosevelt, who is intervening, arguably, yeah. to regulate capitalism in order to save it, I mean, he says as much, quite explicitly, embraces Thomas Jefferson to do so. Franklin Roosevelt was a great admirer of oh, Jefferson. Yeah. He came here to Monticello in 1936. Uh, he will dedicate the, de the Jefferson Memorial in 1943. He harnesses Jeffersonian rhetoric in the service of state intervention in the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's a kind of paradox here. So both Jefferson and Hamilton have moments in the 1930s for different reasons. But it's, and to some extent- but there's a case in which, as yeah, you were please. saying before, right? The, the Hamiltonian reality is just ugly, right? The Jeffersonian rhetoric is, is what we want America to be. The fact that the Jeffersonian rhetoric is applying in some ways to a more Hamiltonian goal. That's it, we live in a Hamiltonian world according to Jeffersonian rhetoric because Jeffersonian rhetoric makes us feel better. Yeah, <laughs> you, you know, many, many yeah. years ago, many years ago I took part in a, like a formal radio, it was a radio show, it was a debate between Hamilton and Jefferson. And they had someone representing, they had someone who had quotes from each person and they had you know, historical authority on each side and Jefferson got to go first and the Jefferson team broke out in the rhetoric of Jefferson, you know, liberty, democracy, you know, all of the things we want America to be. And I could feel, this was in London, I, I could even, not in the United States, I could feel <laughs> the poetry of Jefferson and I was sitting up there and I was like, I'm doomed. Yeah. <laughs> like, how can I compete with that? And then I said, that's all very nice and good. No order, no poetry. And Hamilton won the frickin' debate. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say, no, <laughs> go for the poetry. But, but it, it shows the two sides, right? Joanne, why do you hate freedom? 
this is what historians do in their spare time, ladies and gentlemen. I know the rules of dueling, right? Yeah, absolutely. We will conclude with the duel, just so you know, right here in front of the stage. So be prepared. Just kidding. Okay. So, so what we're going to do now is transition to to questions from uh, both our in-person audience and our online audience, and we've gotten a lot of them. So thank you very much. Um, this first one is, is quite interesting, um, and it's specifically regarding national debt, right? So right now we obviously have a, a large and growing national debt. Um, there are significant concerns about what that will do in the modern age, but debt, both personal and national, was not something that these guys were not familiar with. I mean, it, it, this was ubiquitous uh, in this period of time. So could you speak a little bit about the relationship of, of debt, um, but to conceptions of either personal independence and or democracy, but also on a national level, how, how these guys thought about debt as either an, an emboldening or a constraint on international or on national uh, independence. Well, you know, as far as on a personal level, Hamilton was never very wealthy. He just never had a lot of money. He didn't own his own home until his last couple of years. He was, he was a New York renter uh, for the rest of that time. Um, but when it came to debt, he, on the one, so people liked to misquote him at the time. You know, he said a, the national debt is a national blessing, and people were like, it's yeah. a horrible thing to say. And what he actually said was, properly managed, mm -hmm. a national debt is a national blessing because you can use that capital, yep. you can use that money, you can feed that into the economy. But the important part, particularly given everything I've said about Hamilton, properly managed, mm -hmm. right? That it has to yep. be ordered and managed. Sure. And so when he steps down from being Secretary of the Treasury and he kind of signs off and there's some, what he would have considered to be toying with debt and credit and, and people were arguing about and wanting to do things that he didn't approve of. And he writes this letter to a friend and I, I can't even do it justice. It's like, it's ripping my soul apart. You know, how can this be happening? Am I more American than the people who are here? Like, ah! And so every time we're in a modern crisis and people are like toying with American credit and American debt, this little voice in my head is just like, Hamilton is spinning in his yeah, brain. Oh, yes. He, he fundamentally understood national identity, national credit mm -hmm. with the good of the nation in, in, and, and for himself too, mm -hmm. you know, national honor. Yeah. He talked about national honor in, in many ways in the same way that he talked about personal honor. Mm -hmm. um, there's a certain point at which um, he's worried about national honor being surrendered and he says you have to defend national honor if it's insulted. To not defend honor is to commit political suicide. Mm. He says that about the nation. Yeah. But then in 1804, I don't think he was trying to commit suicide, actually quite the opposite, yeah. but he very much believed that reputation and identity, the, the, the sort of meat of what people were and what the nation was, um, were bound up with uh, credit and reputation. And credit is one of those interesting words that mm -hmm. it's personal, means reputation, and it also is bound up with finance. So it's a great example of all of these things sort of mirroring each other, yeah. being bound together. Absolutely. Jefferson and debt. Well, <laughs> I mean, one thing I'd say about Hamilton, just to, to add on to what you said, Joanne, is, uh, of course, because he emulates Britain, he recognizes the power of debt in the in Britain's rise during the 18th century, mm -hmm. uh, public debt, mm -hmm. that is. Uh, and, you know, we, we now know how the fiscal military state operated in the 18th century. And he's saying, you know, a little bit of debt allows us to do a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson doesn't accept that. Jefferson's very, very skeptical about public debt, in part because he's very, very concerned about his private debt, <laughs> um, which uh, will, you know, bedevil him throughout his life. Not entirely, you know, we often ascribe this to his extravagant living habits, and those are partially due explain for this. He's also unlucky. The Panic of 1819 really harms him, uh, which was an economic downturn in 1819. Uh, he co-signs some loans for, for people that are that, that uh, they default on. So he, he, he's, a, he's a victim of bad luck, but his, he's got a real problem with personal debt, which will result in the um, sale of Monticello after his death. Um, but but uh, as, as a political figure, he's very, very skeptical about public debt and opposed to public debt. However, 
as president, his Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Gallatin, will recognize the value of some debt um, and uh, as a necessity when it comes to running the government. So, Let yeah. me ask you, yeah. a, 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 actually, a Monticello question. I don't know okay. whether you or someone here will know. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming, and I don't know if this is the case, that, that Jefferson did not spare cost in decorating, building, embellishing Monticello. That if he wanted mirrors, he got mirrors and mirrored things. And I ask this only because um, that's what I would expect, a, a sort of of an aristocrat, of a wealthy southern planter, even if you're totally in debt. Hamilton's house, so he only owns something for a handful of years, and then he's killed in the duel. And the people, the park service, um, who runs the house said that when you actually look within the wall, so, so Hamilton wanted a country home, right? He, he was kind of echoing what other people had, but he was, he was very Hamiltonian. Like there are mirrors, but like right under the wall, like the, the moment they can be hidden, it's like they stop. Like it, it was like he managed to get the things he wanted, but as little expense as he could possibly have, kind of trimming things, hiding things, you know, to try and get things in there. And that just feels, again, he never had any money. Jefferson, I think, you tell me how, how that relates with the Jeffersonian spirit. Uh, he spends a lot on Monticello, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. And he's interested in decorating it in a, to, a, you know, to make a statement and into a suitable standard. Having said that, a lot of the labor being provided to Monticello, of course, is not, um, he doesn't have to pay for that, although he's, uh, he's not paying for labor necessarily, all of it. I mean, there's some specialized labor he is. Um, one of the things that bedevils Southern planters is nobody ever calls their debts in. Right. So you can get into debt quite easily because you know, Jefferson's debts are paid by his children and grandchildren, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you, if you're Jefferson, they never actually require you to balance your checkbook. And so you can quite easily get into debt. But he, you know, his house is an expression and an extension of himself. Um, and he does spend a lot on decorating it. Elizabeth sure. Hamilton uh, settled the Hamiltonian checkbook. Not yeah. Hamilton. Hamilton lost his checkbook, actually. Well. <laughs> <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> so the next question we have, which I think is absolutely appropriate, given where we are in the world, um, but it, public education is something that seems to be both quite interwoven uh, with economic development, more broadly, you know, you got to boost that human capital stock. This is the person who teaches at Darden talking. Um, but also, there is a, a civic function in, in education. Um, so, could you speak a little bit about how both of these guys saw the role of public education, or let's say, just say education in general, in this kind of duality, this, this synthesis of democracy and capitalism that we're talking about? Those yeoman farmers need to be educated. Mm -hmm. and not just the farmers, but the farmers' wives, because mm -hmm. they need to understand what it is to be a citizen. And, Recognize danger. And, yeah, and, and understand virtue. Mm -hmm. And consequently, you know, on education, Jefferson's a good guy. Uh, this is, uh, and you know, his bill for the more, more general diffusion of knowledge that he proposes during the revolution isn't enacted by the House of Delegates. However, it proposes universal education, free education, elementary, primary education for free, that is white girls and boys, not just boys, for several years. And then there's a hierarchy culminating in a university, so it will become boys only, mm -hmm. then men, um, as they go up. And, and it's supposed to be a meritocracy, but you can, if you've got the money, you can kind of buy into the system and stay into it. So it's not, it's not perfect, but again, by the standards of its time, it's pretty progressive. Uh, and he'll eventually, he's frustrated that the legislature won't raise the money, won't enact this legislation because it's going to mean raising taxes, and eventually he'll concentrate late in life on creating a university instead. But the university was meant to be the capstone of this system, mm -hmm. not, 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 it wasn't meant to be the whole system. So uh, a citizenry, in order to be virtuous, must be educated. Did it have an economic function in Jefferson's conception? Well, it does because those independent citizens are economic actors as well. So it's part of this vision of political economy. It, it's also worth saying that that's, um, 
it gets back to something that we were talking about earlier, that a republic, a democratic slash constitutional republic, is grounded on the public will uh, to an extreme degree, which for all of these reasons that you just said, Frank, means that the public needs to be educated. And so actually, generally speaking, when the republic gets off the ground, education is a huge yeah. concern because that is, uh, we're talking again about fuel, right? That's going to fuel mm -hmm. or preserve the republic is if people are educated, they understand what it means to be a citizen, they understand what threats to the republic look like, that in some ways empowers women who are seen as the people educating the children at home. And women's education in that period also begins to be focused on for all of these reasons. That, so again, just like you're asking, the political tie mm -hmm. between um, education and, and politics is, is really close and very focused on throughout this time period. Yeah, absolutely. This, this was a fascinating question, um, which I think, again, strikes at kind of the heart of these caricatures that we have of Hamilton and Jefferson. <clears throat> but the question says, to the extent that corporations are unions of capitalists, could Jefferson or Hamilton imagine a labor union? If not, why not? And I find that particularly interesting because in some ways, Right? If we're looking at our caricatures, Hamilton's the big business guy. Right, He doesn't want workers getting together and disrupting things. But Jefferson's also the guy who's like the free marketeer. Right? He doesn't necessarily want like protections for labor in that sense, or the state, you know, the, the, the National Labor Relations Board to be able to ensure the collective bargaining. Um, so, so if we're talking about this, I know this is a bit of a, a counterfactual in terms of what would they think about things that they didn't understand, but I'm going to play the game anyway. Um, given what we know about these guys, how would they think about unions, perhaps, in this case? That's a really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in the first instance, he wouldn't want people working in conditions that would need unions yeah. because he doesn't want people working in manufacturing. Yeah. Right? Sure. Now, uh, and of course, he wants agricultural laborers, at least wants people, farmers to be independent and they're relying on the labor provided by their families or enslaved mm -hmm. people. Um, so no unions there. So I don't think he could... Quite, I, I think he really would struggle to, to conceive of a labor union and what, uh, the purpose of a labor Well, he would understand the purpose. He did understand the importance of um, economic coercion. We saw this mm -hmm. with the, we see it with the embargo. We see it with the boycotts prior to the revolution. So to some extent, collective action, he, he would have understood that. But I think he doesn't want a world where unions are needed. Mm. And I, I think for very different reasons, um, you know, Hamilton just distrusted groups of the public getting together to do anything. Well, they throw rocks at him. <laughs> they throw rocks at him, right? Just, you know, it's, it, he really conceived of um, the government as being one in which the people would step forward, uh, the, the ones who could vote would vote. They have their will, they can give power to people, they can take power from people, and then they should just go home and shut yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, beyond that, it's dangerous. If they're going to protest, that's threatening, you know. So, in that sense, unions would not feel like order to mm -hmm. him. But the complication of that, and I'm not sure how to answer this, is that he would be worried about the good of business mm -hmm. and the survival of corporations. Yes. And that might complicate it yeah. for him in, in some interesting ways. Yeah, I mean, there's that famous, perhaps apocryphal quote from Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who was obviously a famous supporter of unions, trust buster, and, but he always campaigned as the conservative, right? And Theodore Roosevelt adored Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And a reporter came up to him and said, you know, sir, you, you, you're in favor of labor rights, you're in favor of breaking up corporations, sir, how on earth could you campaign as a conservative? And supposedly Theodore Roosevelt's response is, my good man, because I prefer reform to revolution. Right? And that mm -hmm. seems to me perhaps like a pretty Hamiltonian-ish response. Um, well, we have about five minutes left, and uh, so I have a couple of questions. So I do have those that I believe are the world's greatest scholars on these two figures. So I swore that I'm going to take a couple of minutes and, and pose to them uh, a quote and have them respond <laughs> to a quote from these people that they do indeed uh, know so well that that might be a little bit opposite of how we think about it. So your thoughts on this would be great. So Frank, I will start with you. Thomas Jefferson said, and this was in 
1785. Stump. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love it. Uh, that's that's the benefit of being in this chair. Let me tell you what. Um, he said, extending the laws of property to protect the aristocrats' extravagant waste of resources is to is to violate natural right. Extending the laws of property to protect the aristocracy's extravagant waste of resources is to violate natural right. What would you like me to do, Scott? How, how, on, <laughs> earth, how on earth, sitting in not quite the shadow of the mansion up on the hill, but close enough, how can Jefferson kind of conceptualize that? Because we tend to think, oh, he's just irrational. Well, people have their own rationality, right? First of all, people can live with cognitive dissonance. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And we all do in our own lives. So, yeah. so might give him a break on that. Yeah. Secondly, he actually favors taxing wealthy people. Yeah. And, and, and so this isn't completely at odds with that, I think. So I think... Um, uh, I don't think that's as incongruous as your question would suggest. Mm. I, I respond with all due respect. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that, I'm glad you set me up. Jefferson, and, oh, and this is a quote. <laughs> I, thought we were I do have my homework. Now. I do my homework. <laughs> Jefferson uh, proposed a steeply graduated tax that would provide public goods while ensuring that the poor man of this country pays not a farthing of tax to the general government while the farmer will see his government supported, his children educated, and the face of his country made a paradise by the contributions of the rich alone. <laughs> well, that was a good noise. Thank you for proving my point. There you go. <laughs> All right, on to, on to Hamilton. Okay. All right, famous quote. Name He's, that tune. Yeah. In, in three words. He said in a, in a letter to his friend John Lawrence, he said, in perfect confidence, I whisper a word in your ear, I hate money-making men. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds as though he couldn't possibly say that, but he's like 22 <laughs> when he makes that quote. And he's an aide to George Washington. Mm -hmm. He's been sent to North America on charity. He has no money. So, it, and, and he specifically is thinking about a, a particular money-making man, a man who's interested in profit, who's been sent to Europe to help negotiate, to get finance for the nation. So. He actually, in that moment, he would never consider himself a money-making man. He's not yet thinking about like mm -hmm. getting money-making men interested in what we're doing is important. So I think to him at that point, they were still a they. Mm -hmm. um, even though he's interested in the economy, he's very focused on it, he's already writing long letters to people saying what should happen in the economy, um, I think that they were very much a, a them. And I think to some degree, as much as he was mingling within that group, some aspect of him, I think, always felt a step removed from mm. that them because of where he came from. Yeah, absolutely. So the final question we have, it's difficult, we know, um, but do you think, all things considered, that Hamilton and Jefferson would believe that democracy and capitalism could coexist in America? Yes. Do we repeat the last hour and a half? Yeah, so I mean, Jefferson, in, in yeah. terms of unpacking it, I, I think um, I think his vision of political economy doesn't translate well to our time. But it was premised on a belief that politics, economic growth, and political equality—a measure of political equality—could uh, go hand in hand. So I think yes. Yeah, Joan. I think. Also, yes, but I think that he would be very concerned that democracy, free reign democracy, mm -hmm. is going to savage mm -hmm. the economy in some way that will not be reparable. Mm -hmm. So I think he would say yes, but, mm -hmm. and he would be watching very closely to see how, how wild is that democracy going to get. One of the last letters that he wrote before the duel uh, is to a friend of his, and he describes um, the disease, the main disease that's affecting the American nation as democracy. And in his mind, that's the public, the public will, the public doing whatever they want to do. Then, and again, out of order, who knows what they're going to do, unstable. So that, I don't think that idea is ever very far from him. 
you've asked us uh, uh, to be anachronistic. I yeah. think the difference is Hamilton, as Joanna so eloquently said, saw democracy as a threat to capitalism in this yeah. binary you've given us, whereas Jefferson would see the excesses of capitalism as being a threat to democracy. Mm. And that's why for most of the two centuries prior to Lynn manuel Miranda, we preferred Jefferson. <laughs> and with that, will you please uh, join me in thanking Joanne and Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here at the Miller Center and on behalf of our partners, the Karsh Institute of Democracy uh, and Monticello. Uh, stay tuned for other uh, Miller Center and Democracy, a project on democracy and capitalism events and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Thank you so much.